cold open for you today because recently I had to reinstall my operating system and when I did that it secretly switched audio inputs on me so I recorded this entire episode with a terrible microphone accidentally. John's gonna sound lovely and I will sound terrible but I just wanted to let you know that that was going to happen, and I'll be sure to attend some audio production workshops at PodCon so it happens less, which, by the way, is in the middle of its crowdfunding campaign. See the linky? I'd made a transition there. So many cool people will be at PodCon. Hannah Hart, Kathy and Tobin of Nancy, Demi and Miel of Punch Up the Jams, Aaron Mankey of Lore, the McElroy Brothers, Oh No, Ross and Carrie, Hello from the Magic Tavern, the Bright Sessions, and so many more. So check it out. Podcon.com. And now, get ready for some terrible audio. Hello and welcome to Dear Hank and John. Nor as I prefer to think of it, Dear John and Hank. It's a comedy podcast where two brothers answer your questions, give you dubious advice, and bring you all the week's news from Mars and AFC Wimbledon. John, what is the elephant in the room? All right, Hank, are you ready? On three, one, two, three... The, the elephant, elephant in, in the room. Oh, uh, really? Right, well, I, I, I think that... So last week, John, we, we simultaneously yeah. elephanted for the first right. time. And I feel like yeah. maybe we should just end the elephant in the room there and that the elephant that... in the room is the elephant in the room needs to, needs to be done with. Hank, that is exactly what I was going to propose. Uh, that was what like, a shock! What a wonderful moment of mind mild, mind melding between brothers. I I agree with you. The elephant in the room has been beautiful, and it's been wonderful, and it's been a great opening bit, and it has also ended. It, yeah, and I mean, I think that you like we, uh, this level of adjustment is really what our audience is here for. They don't want the same podcast every week, John. They want to know that the opening bit's going to be different and that from now on we're going to be doing reviews of chapstick and just various kinds of lip balms. I like the chapstick review idea. I don't love it. What I would suggest is that we have our listeners email in suggestions for opening bits at hankandjohn at gmail.com and we will use one of them as the new opening bit unless none of them are good, in which case we will use the chapstick idea. <laughs> Or we could, or we could have a different one. I just had chapstick here in front of me. That's all that happened. I do want to put some on my lips now, though, because it's always a little bit dry here in Montana. Oh yeah, that's good. John, do you want to do some questions from our listeners? No, I want to turn this into an ASMR podcast where you do nothing but put chapstick on your lips. Oh yes, God. I want to answer questions from our listeners. All right, John, this first one comes from Tim. And Tim asks, Dear Hank and John, I know that Hank has mentioned that his book, An Absolutely Remarkable Thing, comes out on Tuesday, September 25th, and it's available for pre-order now. I know that he has mentioned that not all pre-orders will be signed. However, I could, couldn't Hank's publisher just copy a page of Hank's signature equal to the amount of all the books that are pre-ordered and then pre-orders will be signed i mean it's just one extra piece of paper that needs to be copied and bound in the beginning of the book is this not a thing no tim, tim. is of the essence tim oh tim is of the essence is a pretty good name specific sign off if i were named tim every time i met people i would be like hey my name is tim is of the essence no, no. Uh, please don't give that advice to Tim. I feel very bad. That seems like the kind of thing that, like, that, like, high school John would totally have done, and it was not a good idea. Uh, it's so true. High school John wearing his uh, FAO Schwartz beanie with the little <laughs> propeller on top would have absolutely introduced himself as Tim is of the essence, despite not being named Tim. Anyway, I used to think that beanie Tim. was so cool, John. I used to think you were the coolest person, that you were confident enough to wear that dumb FAO shorts beanie. And I want everyone to know that that's not a thing we made up for. That was not like a bit. That's actually a thing that John did. I wore it all the time in high school. I mean... It was so dirty. There's pictures of, there's pictures of me wearing it in the flippin' yearbook. Anyway... <laughs> Tim, we need to move past my beanie immediately before it becomes like a recurring bit. We've got to we, uh, panic. We've got to move on, Tim. The reason that Hank's publisher can't put digitally rendered copies of his signature in every copy of An Absolutely Remarkable Thing is that that is not a signature. For something to be a signature, the human hand has to have made it or the human foot. Yeah, well, I did sign three or four with the foot, but it turned out that was pretty inefficient. The 
it makes me think that like does Tim think that like I didn't actually sign the books? Does Tim think that this is just like a like a picture of my signature? It's spent I've spent a lot of time signing books for people to think that. I spent a lot of time thinking about this because I've signed my name around four hundred fifty thousand times in the last seven years, <laughs> and that's given me ample time to think about signing. <laughs> the thing that I've come around to when thinking about signing is that I'm trying to physicalize a very weird thing. I'm trying to like give it form and structure and explain it to my brain because brains are bad at big numbers. And I'm trying to tell my brain, a lot of people have put their trust in you with this book. And this is how you're going to acknowledge it and recognize it and kind of come to terms with what it is. And so I think that for a signature to work, at least for me, it still has to be a real signature made mm -hmm. with a marker, mm -hmm. preferably a Sharpie, <laughs> etc. cetera. If, if Sharpie wants to call in with a sponsorship, that would totally be acceptable. Um, hey, I, I don't want to get too, I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but Sharpie just launched a huge ad campaign with Aaron Judge, who's on the New York Yankees, and at least from like watching the commercials on Twitter, does not seem to be a particularly passionate Sharpie user. Whereas you've got me waiting in the wings, somebody who's used thousands of Sharpies over the last 10 years, somebody who has incredibly strong feelings about Sharpies and why they are far and away the greatest permanent marker in the history of our entire civilization. And we got Aaron Judge talking about like how Sharpies can send positive messages. Come on. Well, he has Sorry. hit 82 home about? runs. I don't know if he did any of those with Sharpies, but that's more than you. <laughs> and he's only, he's only 26 expert. years old, John. Six, six foot seven, handsome man. There's, there, are, there are things that he has that you don't have. Let's just all admit it. Oh, oh yeah, no. He is, uh, he is a pleasure to look at. What was the question? <laughs> I'm not really sure, but I signed all of the things and I only had some, enough time to sign 40,000. And thank you so much, people who have purchased my book, uh, pre-ordered it. There will be signed copies available at bookstores and at places that sell books that aren't bookstores. But uh, they have sold out on Amazon, but you can still get them at barnesandnoble.com if you want to check that out. John, do you want to hit us with another question? Yeah, I kind of want to wax poetic on how much i like your book but we it's fine we'll, ju we'll just move on to the next question i do really love your book though and i'm so excited for everybody to read it this question comes from ashlyn who writes dear john and hank i'm 16 years old and i am home alone for the next few days while my mother is on a camping trip it's nighttime now and i am extremely fearful of home invasions at the best of times let alone when i am alone how do i survive these next few days on my own any and all dubious advice is welcome and appreciated don't harsh on my yums Ashlyn. I got to admit, I don't have a lot of anxiety about this kind of thing, even though, of course, like bad, bad things do occur. Um, statistically, they occur less often than we might think, but that doesn't mean that they don't happen. Uh, is it possible that you can't, can't, you can go home alone on this and just put like bacon grease all over the doorknob so that they just can't like you could if they could pick the, the lock, they could, but they can't even twist the knob or 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 hear me out. Get a dachshund, because as far as I can tell, it's scarier than a German Shepherd. Like these little things that are full of little mouth razors. And I don't like, can you get a dachshund real fast? Like a temporary loan dachshund? Oh, I'm sure there are lots of people with dachshunds out there who would be more than happy to loan their dachshund to Ashland for a week. <laughs> when I was a kid. Possibly permanently. Just like there's enough, there's enough dachshund in my life, it turns I, out. I thought that this was cute, but it turns out it's a dachshund. <laughs> well, dachshunds are very cute. They're great dogs. Don't get me wrong. But when I was a kid, I had a dachshund. And I also had an experience similar to this, Ashlyn, because my parents and Hank went to England uh, for like a week when I was a senior in high school. And they left me behind. There's no need to get into the details of why this happened, <laughs> but I ended up spending a week at home by myself in a very similar situation. I am also a fairly anxious person, so I can totally relate uh, to, to what you're going through, Ashlyn. And I did find it very helpful to have our dog, Red Green, there. Although, I mean, Red Green, who was a beautiful dachshund, was also a very difficult dog. And my primary memory of that week is that every morning, I was working the graveyard shift at Steak and Shake, and every morning I would come home, go to sleep, red green, would jump up on my bed, scratch at my face to wake me up, and then he would look at me, we'd make eye contact, I'd be like, good morning, red, how are you? And then he would jump down onto the carpet, and then still staring at me, he would pee. 
Yeah, he did have a defiant P streak. He really liked you to know that he was doing it. It was extremely important for him to be making eye contact <laughs> with you when he peed on the carpet. This next question comes from Scotty. I think we helped. Yeah, no. Who I asked mean, Steer Hank and John? We've solved another problem. <laughs> If you uh, could have one extra eye on your body, where would you decide to put it? Obviously, it would be nice to see things behind you, but it may come with lots of added sensitivity that would get in the way of an active and productive lifestyle. <laughs> would it be better just to put it on the forehead and continue living a regular lifestyle, albeit with a strangely placed eye patch? Why would you cover it up? Scotty doesn't know, but wants to. Wait, Scotty, does this hypothetical third eye not blink? Like, am I not allowed to close it? Well, that's the thing. Can you just have it closed most of the time and then only open it sometimes? Because that'd be good. But I, yeah. I assume I assume that it's a fully functioning eye. It can blink, it can close, it can squint, it has tear ducts, all of this stuff. Okay, in that case, I don't even think there's a competition. There's only one possible answer. I assume you agree with me. Okay, I, I have my answer. My answer is the inside of the wrist. Oh, interesting. I was thinking the palm of my left hand. Well, but then you're going to, like, cover it up with your fingers sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't you think that, like, that it'd be cooler a little bit to have an eye on the the palm of the hand. Like, that's a very, like, a good visual. But I think that it's definitely a more... Yeah, but then every time you shake hands with somebody, your eye's going to get, like, up real close to their skin flesh. Yeah, it's probably going to get a sty. Definitely going to get a sty if it's on the hands. Right. It's just always very dirty. Yeah. yeah. No, the in, the inside of the wrist is the obvious place. And that way you can swivel. So you can look forward. You can look backward. You can also do the sort of periscope thing where you just reach your arm around a doorway. Um, and then open yeah, that up was your my third first eye thought. real quick. Yeah. So, Hank, last night I actually, just for fun, the great thing about kids, and as your son gets older, you'll learn this. The great thing about kids is that they're pretty suggestible and they're not totally sure of reality, right? Because everything's so new and there's a lot of weird things that are true. So who knows? Mm -hmm. So I was reading these questions last night going through them and I said to Alice, um, hey, Alice, I can see you with my foot eye. She was kind of standing in the doorway and I couldn't really see her, but I could see her reflection. And she said, no, you mm -hmm. can't. You don't have a foot eye. And I was like, no, yeah, I can. You're wearing your jean shorts and your T-shirt that says, let's be mermaids. And Alice was like, oh, you can see me yeah. with a third eye? And I was like, yeah, with my yeah. foot eye, the eye on my foot. That's good. And then they spent a <laughs> solid hour trying to, like, test the hypothesis that dad had a, a foot eye. <laughs> That's good. I like it. I just, in general, I like... Uh, I like, you know, ha harmless child pranks. So very good. Very good on you. Um, but but maybe there would be something to it being a foot eye. It, people maybe maybe won't see it as easily if it's down there. And you just sort of like thumb, like you just like toe your sock off. And then it's just like, whoop, 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 looking around with my foot eye. Yeah, I don't know. Then you also get to call it a foot eye. So that's good. I mean, I probably would, I, honestly, I'd probably stick it in the back of my head so that it'd be covered with my hair most of the time so people wouldn't have to know about it and then I could just lift up the hair if I wanted to see behind mm. me. That'd be cool. All I know for sure is that I want a t-shirt that says, let's be mermaids. It doesn't seem fair that Alice gets to have that t-shirt and I don't. Um, you know, John, you're the kind of guy who can make something like that happen if you really want to. There's like the internet is designed for, for people like that. I feel like you're the kind of guy who can make something like that happen, and I'm the kind of guy who's going to end up having to pay for half the manufacturing costs. <laughs> or you're the guy who's just going to get a really nice birthday present from your brother. Oh, man, that would be awesome. I mean, if that's what you're getting me for my birthday, I'll be absolutely thrilled. Um, <laughs> all right. I think I feel like we're a little bit off the rails here, Green. All right. Well, hit me with another question then, boy. Okay, Hank. This next question comes from Kim, who writes, Dear John and Hank, I have a problem. I stayed overnight at a friend's place last night, and she's gone to work today, leaving me alone in her apartment for a few hours. Here's the problem. I cleaned her bathroom. I won't see her again before I leave, and my worry is that this may come off as rude or like I'm judging her. At the time, I thought I was being nice, but this is a recurring issue in my life, as I have oh often gosh. been accused of passive-aggressive cleaning. What should I do? Kim. <laughs> Kim. Oh, gosh, what a good problem to have. I guess you got to make that bathroom dirty again. You just got to go, like, like, cut some hairs, <laughs> leave them around, leave some hairs around, uh... I don't know. Yeah, just put some toothpaste on some stuff and rub it in, I guess. God, I, 
I need to get some friends who passive aggressively clean. Right. Yeah, no, I like Kim. In all honesty, I know that you've probably fixed this problem by now, but I think that you did a good. I think that you helped, and that no one will see that as anything but be, you being nice and uh, saying. And and you could, if you wanted to, be like, "Thanks for letting me stay at your place." Uh, to say thanks, I cleaned up your your bathroom, not because it was gross, but because I'm like you. I think that's great, great advice, Hank, and hopefully the kind of advice that's going to make Kim like us enough to you know stop by for a <laughs> cocktail sometime. <laughs> Yeah. Kim's been in the bathroom for a while, huh? (laughs) What's she doing in there? (laughs) How many times do you think I'd have to have Kim over on consecutive Wednesdays before she noticed? (laughs) (laughs) That there was an ulterior motive, you mean? Yeah, where it's just like, man, he invites us over every Wednesday afternoon. It's crazy. Then I clean the bathroom for an hour after we hang out, and then I head home. <laughs> I have a friend who invariably, if you invite if invite him over and you have food, he will do all the dishes. He does it every oh, single time. To th- I love and it's this just people. like it's to the point where I like I'm like you're too good. You're too good of a person. I don't understand what it's like to be you. I could n- I would never. And now I like I've started to like try and be this like in modeling of my friend Brian to be the kind of person who like while everybody else is off doing something like sneak real quick in the kitchen start to do some dishes and they come in and you're, you're doing the dishes I just thought I'd be a nice help I thought and like never would I have that idea on my own but Brian every time he's doing the dishes so great I was, I want to hug him right now I will say this I usually do the dishes at parties that I attend and it really? is Good for you. a slightly selfless act but it is mostly selfish mostly <laughs> at that point in the party there's been so much like um, talking among humans and social contact and everything <laughs> that what I really want is I want to be alone for 45 minutes and there is no <laughs> place more alone at a party than the dishwashing station you just pop out your Bluetooth headphones and you're like, it's I gonna literally, be me. Will, I literally will put on a podcast and do the dishes very <laughs> happily for 45 minutes and feel restored and able to return to the party. I got another question, John. It's an important one. It's one that I've been wondering about for a long time myself, and I did research to answer it. So we'll see what you think, and then you'll find out what I know. It's from Matt, who asks, Dear Hank and John, big fan of the pod. My question to you is simple. Why do we call underwear a pair of underwear last i recalled my undergarments were a single unit not a pair of units keeping things brief matt yes yes great well done very good question so here's what i know hank you know the phrase uh everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time or you'll hear someone say Mm -hmm. like well elon musk puts his pants on one leg at a time just like the rest of us Mm mm-hmm I've never understood that phrase because I have always put my pants on both legs at the same time to save time. Do you do you just like jump in? Like do is like a is it like a dangerous acrobatic maneuver? No, I mean it's going to surprise you to learn that it's not a particularly athletic maneuver. Unlike Sharpie spokesman Aaron Judge, I'm not a professional athlete. No, I lie down on 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 my bed on my back and I pull my pants on both legs at the same time. I've done this as far back as I can remember. And so whenever anybody's like, oh, everybody puts their (laughs) pants on one leg at a time, I always think to myself, I don't. Not me, man. My guess is that people used to put their pant legs on one at a time because they were actually separate pant legs. And that that is why they are called a pair of pants or a pair of underwear is that it used to actually be a pair. That is correct, John. You got it correct. And there's oh. all kinds of wow. all kinds of these like uh, breeches, shorts, panties, knickers, trousers, all plural. Because once upon a time, we would put each pant like there would be one, it was basically like a skirt for each leg, kind of. And then you tie them up like chaps, like cowboy chaps, uh, and you would tie them up at the top. Uh, whereas a shirt would be like a single unit of cloth and pants would be two different separate units of cloth. Weird. To me, it feels like one of those things where, where our words remember things that we have forgotten. And I think that's so cool when that happens. That's a lovely way of saying it, Hank. And a great reminder that 
even after we're gone, little parts of us survive, like pants. <laughs> like pants. <laughs> I don't know why I had to take your lovely sentiment and then turn it into a really bad metaphor. But I mean, I guess that's sort of my stock and trade. I'm happy. I'm happy with it. I think it all turned out well. Okay. All right, Hank, we got another question. This one's from Lou, who writes, Dear John and Hank, my coworker just emailed me a question. Even though we sit five feet away from each other, there are no walls or dividers between us, as in we're not in cubicles or separate offices or whatever, totally a shared space. Do I answer the question by responding to the email or simply by answering out loud in my regular voice because I don't need to shout? Skip to my Lou. I think that there is a how I would do this and a how office etiquette should be answer to this question. Which one should I give, John? How would you do this, Hank? I would say it's it's 630. The, the meeting is at 630 is how I would do it. Oh, see, I would I would be even more passive aggressive than that. I would be like, I think if you look in your calendar, you'll see when the meeting is. <laughs> Why don't Let you me refer Google to your that calendar you, software? Jeremy. <laughs> there should uh, be, you should have to do some kind of challenging physical activity before you're allowed to write an email. You should have to do like <laughs> 25 push ups. And then at the end of the 25 push ups, you can write one email. And then the next time you want to write an email, you can be like, do I want to do 25 more push ups? Or do I want to talk to the person who's five feet away from me? Or, or like, I, I mean, this is like legitimate, like workplace frustrations I have. Like, I need you to be thinking, how can I make this the last email in this thread? Like, what is there yes. a probability that I can answer all of the questions with this one email? And if you got to do 25 push-ups before you send another one, you're going to be thinking real hard about making this one perfect. And making yeah. it, like, solving all the problems as fast as possible. I'm not trying to acquire pen pals. <laughs> I'm trying to get my inbox to zero. Yeah, I mean, like, but Lou, Lou, my situation here is, like, is there some, like, does this person need a paper trail? Like, are they trying to, like, make sure that they that they can prove that they they did this? That is what I assume. They have to have a paper trail so that they can show their supervisor oh no look i did email lou about this at 3 13 p.m on tuesday or whatever but how horrifying is that to have that much of your life exist only for the purpose of bureaucracy that is that is frustrating in those situations but I, is it also like in the in sort of office etiquette it may be that like we're just trying to keep the noise level down like we're like we're not trying to distract we're in an open office floor plan this is not the best way for like the best system for productivity and so we're trying to keep we're trying to keep the the talking to a minimum i don't want to have a conversation right now i just need to know when when we're meeting with our our new client chapstick it's at 6 30 p.m and also i think it's actually sharpie <laughs> which reminds me that this, the, the sponsor of this podcast is of course sharpie stick it's a new collaboration between chapstick and sharpie where you could just it's like a really fine point <laughs> chapstick and it, you can really hank. draw it on there perfectly what hank what it's a sharpie on one end and oh. chapstick on the other Okay, that's You've what it just is. made the most important innovation in the actual history of ChapStick. Hank, after so many consecutive terrible ideas, you've had a Wait. great idea. I don't know. This idea is as good as Dorito tacos. This is an idea that is going to reshape the history of humanity. I don't know if we need to call ChapStick first or Sharpie first. Are they owned by the same company? Hank, I cannot believe that you just had that idea. <laughs> Holy cow. All right, well, I'm glad you like it. I don't, but I, I believe you. I believe in you, John. I believe in your passion for my bad idea. That wasn't even actually my idea. Chapstick is owned by Pfizer. Pfizer, um, of course. Doesn't... You know, they're, they're in the, they make Viagra and Chapstick. <laughs> I think those are their two big products. And uh, Sharpie. Is owned by, it's owned by Newell Brands, which is a bunch of, a bunch of things. But I think Rubbermaid is their biggest brand. Okay, Newell Brands, they got any chapstick? Do they own, like, Blistex or something? <laughs> I don't think so. 
I'm a, I am about to change the history of Newell Brands and take it from a struggling producer of pens and Sharpies to the largest. Oh, they own. Actually, they are a very large company. <laughs> they seem They're to be big. doing fine. I'm not sure that they necessarily need us. <laughs> Oh, they own a they own a they own a fishing pole company, John. They could make Sharpie fishing poles, though. I can't. They own a candle company. Why don't they make um, Sharpie candles? You know. Yeah. It li- it lights while it lights while you write. Wow, John. Right. We were talking about the sponsors. Today's podcast is also brought to you by Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge. I think he plays for the Yankees. I'm pretty sure that's correct. And also, this podcast is brought to you by John's 19. 19- 92 FAO Schwartz beanie acquired and mm. worn a lot. Mm. Boy, as much as I wish it had been 1992, I regret to inform you that it was 1994 when I was 16. Oh. And lastly, today's podcast is brought to you by Plural Pants. Plural Pants, because <laughs> there used to be two of them. <laughs> And finally, we have our actual sponsor, John. We got a real sponsor. Our sponsor today is HelloFresh. It's a meal kit delivery service that shops and plans and delivers step by step recipes and pre measured ingredients so that you can cook, eat, and enjoy. John, wait, are you up with the HelloFresh these days? Oh, yeah. We just had a HelloFresh meal like last night. Oh, good for you. What was it? Last night, we had Hawaiian chicken poke bowls, oh! which it was so good. And poke also, bowl. they give you all the nutrition information, so I was able to make sure that it was well inside the nutritional needs that I have at the moment because I'm trying to just shk, shk, just, just a little bit. Shk, just a little bit. Uh, Catherine and I recently, yeah. we do the vegetarian HelloFreshers for the most part, though we occasionally mm-hmm. will switch over to the meat just for uh, for an ex- ex- exciting week. Uh, and got they have these like uh, this pita pocket recipe where it's like a pita and then there's sweet potatoes and avocado and um, and pine nuts in it. It's so good. Uh, we had that last week, um, and I'm a big uh, big fan. Uh, HelloFresh. Uh, has three different plans you can choose from. You got classic, veggie, and family. And each box is made up of fresh, responsibly obtained ingredients from carefully selected farms and high-rated, trusted sources. It's like fuss-free, easy to figure out how to make food. Cleanup is actually really, uh, really quick, generally, which is good because that's mostly what I'm responsible for. And for thirty dollars off your first week of HelloFresh, you can go to HelloFresh.com and enter Dear John. Or wow. Dear Hank in the offer code. They both work, but Dear John is better. Dear Hank is is so good. It's going to get you the exact same same discount, but like, I don't know. Uh, I've always found that Hank is just easier to type. John is easier to type. You can do it all with one hand. It's your, it's it's all right handed. It's good to it's good to mix it up the hands though, so that you get one your hand gets a little chance to recover in the middle of the word. Once again, that's HelloFresh.com. <laughs> Enter the offer code Dear John or Dear Hank. This next question, this is a real one, John. You ready for a real one? Yeah, let's get let's get real. Haley asks, Dear Hank and John, my name is Haley, and I'm very connected to my Norwegian heritage. Most folks where I'm from are all good Norsks, which is signified by my last name. I've always loved my family and heritage and my name. However, on November 3rd, I'm getting married and have agreed to change my name to Green. Haley, you're going to be a Green. This is exciting. Oh, oh, never mind. No offense, but I don't really like this name. <laughs> It's very common. Yeah, fair enough. As very, she says it's very common, which I don't know if I agree with that. And I already have a very common first name. My fiance has an Irish heritage, but has no connection to it. I've had my name my whole life, and it's part of who I am. I have a signature and everything. I don't really want to change my name, but I've agreed to do it. I will change it, but I want to do it joyfully. This feels like a loss. The two of you have had your name for a while now, and I was wondering if you have some advice on how to love being a green best regards the future Haley green Haley, i don't know that you're gonna like my advice but it's pretty clear from your email that you don't really want to change your name Mm -hmm. and i know that's a little bit of a leap for me to make but the part of the email that i'm uh thinking about is the part where you say and i'm quoting directly here i don't really want to change my name (laughs) I don't think you should change your name. Yeah. I think that you should continue to be Haley with the Norwegian last name that makes you feel connected to your heritage. And I don't think that's going to have a negative impact uh, yeah. on, on your marriage. As you say, I've had my name my whole life and it's part of who I am. Uh, I know you may have agreed to change it, but 
now's the time. It gets much harder after you change it to change it back. So yeah. I think you have a series of conversations with the person you're marrying. And as part of that, say, I like my name. It connects me to my heritage and I don't really want to change it. And if they really, really want you to change it, that's a little bit of a red flag for me. I feel the same. Um, and when you say that this is something you've agreed to, I think it's really important when you're especially going to have like a very long term relationship that you recognize that sometimes you agree to things that you don't realize how much you were asking of yourself and you need to change that expectation and you need to, to you know, like correct that. And that's something that, you know, it's not like you make one decision and that decision stands forever. Like th these things have to be conversations and they have to be part of you know, what, you know, and also like part of the forgiveness of a relationship. That said, Hank, and I completely agree with you. What are some of the awesome things about having the last name green? It's, uh, it's, it's green. Like the color is how you don't have to explain to people how to spell it. I occasionally will say it's green, like the color. And then someone will say back to me with an E on the end. And I say, no, <laughs> no, just G R E E N. Like the color. But it is usually pretty easy to get people to spell your last name, which is a big upside. There's no. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Another big advantage of it, Haley, is that sometimes you'll meet someone and you'll tell them your name and they'll say, Your last name is a color? And you'll say, Yes. And then they won't really have a follow up. So that's always a fun <laughs> conversation. <laughs> There's always, sometimes there's a me too about that. Like, oh, I also have my last name is also a color. That's, we have that in common. Or they'll be like, my last name is also a noun. And I'll be like, is it Forrester? And they're like, yeah, the Subaru Forester. Well, a Forester is a noun. It's, it's a person. A Forester is a person who does forestry. No. Yes. A Forester is a car made by Subaru. What is a, is a, <laughs> Well, what would it be besides a noun? You're right. It's just the Subaru. You're right. Oh, actually, a forester is a person who practices forestry. You're right. <laughs> I was right the whole time. And that is exactly what the Wikipedia page okay. says. Okay. You, you want me to read you a list of notable foresters? Look at this photo of foresters. Or should we save that for this <laughs> week in Ryan's? <laughs> Oh, man, this is a pretty long list of notable foresters, John. I mean, I will say this. I've heard of exactly one of these purportedly notable foresters. <laughs> I've heard of two of them. Who? Jeffrey Chaucer and uh, John Muir? And John Muir, of course. Uh, yeah. yeah, I guess, I guess I'm oh, reasonably... Oh, also familiar. Aldo Leopold. There's some oh. good notable foresters on Didn't here. Didn't Aldo Leopold write a Sand County Almanac? It's possible. Did you know that there was a notable forester named Carl von Karlowitz? <laughs> <laughs> so, Haley, I mean, at least it's not that bad, right? I mean, at least you're not changing your name to, like, Haley von Karlowitz. Haley. Or Haley von Haleywitz. <laughs> actually, actually back up everything. What you guys need to do, Haley, is that thing, you know that thing now with a lot of young couples where instead of um, one person picking the other's last name, they just come up with a totally new last name? Mm -hmm. I think that's what it should be. It should be Von Haleywitz. <laughs> well, you change his name to Von Haleywitz and you change your name to Von whatever his name is. Von Greenwitz. <laughs> I was thinking the first name, but okay. Well, I think their name probably is Green Green, although we don't have direct evidence of that. John? What do you think is the furthest that Aaron Judge could hit a baseball with a Sharpie? <laughs> You're not leaving it I'm behind, sorry, I'm are trying you? To get over, I'm is... trying to get over my feelings about Aaron Judge being the new spokesperson for Sharpie, but... I mean, the guy really did take my dream job right out from under me. I mean, you've been trying to cultivate that relationship for years. And what what did he do? Nothing. You know, you think that he, like, has been talking up Sharpie on social media for the last five years? No, no. No, he's just been hitting home runs. He's got a good agent is all he yeah. did. And hit home runs and was handsome and 6'7". <laughs> which, which, to be fair, is a major accomplishment. Haley, you're going to be just fine no matter what. <laughs> Godspeed, whether you're a green or anything else, we are excited for you and for your future. Absolutely. John, 
You want to hit me with some of that AFC Wimbledon news? Oh, Hank, it's been a devastating week for AFC Wimbledon. Oh, oh no. I thought that things were looking up. Devastating. So, I'm sorry. John Meads are left back at the age of just 26. One of the best players for AFC Wimbledon over the last several years and a wonderful person. When he received the Man of the Match award, when Henry and I went to a game together and he spent so much time with Henry uh, during the, the ceremony after the after the game. You know, the players are often in the bar area after the game, but Meads, he spent so much time with Henry and was so kind to him. And Henry still says that John Meads is his favorite soccer player. But uh, after uh, signing a new contract with AFC Wimbledon in June, Unfortunately, uh, John Meads has uh, decided that he has to retire from professional football uh, at the age of just 26 because of his persistent ankle injuries. So it's a really sad thing because he's such a great guy and such a wonderful player, the kind of professional that any any team would would want to have. Uh, But he's had these ankle problems for a long time. He's had several surgeries and unfortunately... Uh, he, he just doesn't feel like he's able to go on playing uh, at a professional level. So John Meads had to retire uh, just a few days before the beginning of the League One season. Uh, Wimbledon have signed a replacement, a, a guy named Ben Purrington, which is a pretty great name. Uh, oh, yeah. Haley, have you considered the last name Purrington? <laughs> He's 22, and uh, he's on loan from Rotherham United, who were promoted up from the third tier to the second tier this season. So good luck to Ben Purrington, but I'm just absolutely devastated for Meadsy. What a great guy, and uh, what a great player, and I I wish him all the best in the future. Well, John, as you probably have heard, the the news from Mars is big, and it's good, and it's exciting, and it's weird. Really big. Big. Real big. As big as it gets. It's a... Well, it could get bigger. We're still working on our way to the biggest news, John. All right, Hank, Which what's the news from like Mars? Which is just like surprise, surprise humans landing on the planet before 2028. That's the big news. <laughs> that's what we're waiting for. Uh, just without anybody without anybody knowing. It's got, it, it happened. It just happened. Uh, Elon the big Musk news looks is that, uh, super focused on getting humans to Mars right now. <laughs> <laughs> the big news is that there uh, there is a a European Space Agency instrument that has been doing a bunch of uh, work on like and, and taking readings from Mars, basically with with like ground penetrating radar. So they like hits Mars with a like a high energy sound wave, basically, and that bounces back to the craft, and it can measure like when different echoes come back. So of course the big one comes back right when it hits the surface, but then some of that stuff goes down. And then when it hits changes in uh, the kinds of materials it's passing through, it bounces like certain amounts bounces back. And based on how much bounces back, you can tell what those transitions are between areas. And it is very clear after a lot of looking and a lot of remeasuring of this area that there is a subsurface lake that's way down, like it's more than a kilometer down under the surface, so it's not like it's easily accessible or anything, but a subsurface lake of liquid water. And the way that this water is liquid, because this is at the, this is like at the pole, it's very cold, it's cold all the way down, it's not, it doesn't seem to be being heated by geothermal energy sources or something, which would be the most exciting way that this could be warm. It seems to be, uh, or liquid, it seems to be liquid because uh, it is really, really briny. So it has a lot of perchlorate salts, which help the water not turn into ice because it prevents the, the crystals from forming. And there's also some thought that it might be pretty slushy, like a lot of like mixed around with mud and dirt and particles and stuff. But it is liquid water, we're almost entirely sure. And though that percentage of perchlorate salts that would make it like the, the highest, the high percentage that would be necessary for it to stay liquid would be the kind of amount of perchlorate salts that would make it pretty difficult for life to live there. Um, perchlorates are toxic to us. You certainly don't want to consume any of them, but there are organisms on Earth that actually consume perchlorates. But this hmm. level of uh, this level of perchlorate like saturation would not be something that would make those organisms happy. So. We're not sure what it means. It probably is that it's very briny and very like full of full of 
perchlorate salts, which is not great for life, but it's certainly better for life than no liquid water at all. And then I've actually was able to talk a little bit with some people who uh, at the ESA and at the Planetary Society about this, like how likely it is that it might be some combination of geothermal heat and perchlorate. They can actually tell pretty well that, um, you know, looking at the surface temperatures there and, and sort of modeling how heat gets passed around, it seems like there's probably not a lot of heat down there that's keeping mm. it liquid. It's 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 just the chemical composition of the water. So that's cool. That's good. That's big. It's weird. But in general, like Mars turns about to be a pretty wet place. Definitely was a very wet place, even on its surface billions of years ago. So it could be the kind of place where, uh, you know, life existed once and, and has maybe even held on in some places. The question being, like, if we could even figure out what life looks like, if it's that different from us, where it can survive in that kind of environment. But, um, but wet water allows for a lot of interesting chemistry to happen. And that is a very cool thing to know is there on Mars. So we know the water's wet. We know that it's kept liquid, probably not by being super warm, but instead mm -hmm. because it's so briny. Yeah. And we know that its brininess is probably not great for life. Correct. Correct. Yes. Probably not. But maybe not a deal breaker for life. You know, life uh, finds a way. <laughs> I mean, the thing that I keep coming back to, and I, this is something I will follow with great interest for the rest of my life, but the thing I keep coming back to is that even on Earth, life isn't really a dichotomy. This is alive, that is not alive. It's much more like a continuum. This is more alive than that. And I wonder if when we go to Mars or know more about Mars, if that continuum is going to become even weirder and less certain and more problematic because then we'll have to decide well is this life when it's so different from the life that we know and experience here and not only that we'll have to figure out do we have to protect that life like do do we have to stay off of that planet because our life probably is going to be better at being life than that life and uh and if we start changing changing the surface chemistry of mars changing the atmosphere composition uh, do we basically say, like, well, not only are we going to, like, extinct some species right now, if this is an entirely different lineage of life, are we going to extinct an entire new kind of, kind of, like, you know, sort of chemical sustainability, for lack of a different term? Right. And then are humans going to have to make the difficult decision not to go? which humans are so bad at, right? Like humans are so oh, yeah. bad oh, at resisting unlikely. the urge to explore something. I just made an episode of the Anthropocene Reviewed about the caves at Lausanne, in part because humans have done a pretty good job over the last 70 years of stopping going when it became unsustainable for them to be mm -hmm. there. But I feel like with something as big and exciting and full of possibility as life on another planet, we're going to have a really hard time not going. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I don't know how to how to hold that back myself, because uh, I certainly want to go. I mean, not personally. I, I love I love it in my chair. Oh, yeah. God, no, not personally. But I, I, I would like some other people to go and report back to me on what it was like. We've got a Project for Awesome message this week from Frédéric Garzon from Paris, France, who contributed to the Project for Awesome. Thank you, Frederic. I apologize, by the way, if I'm mispronouncing your name. It's been a number of years since my high school French classes, and as my high school French teacher would be happy to point out, I was also a terrible student. A quick cuckoo to the French-speaking nerdfighters out there. Hank and John, merci okay. for everything you do with the Project for Awesome Crash Course and SciShow. You prove every day that the internet is a great place to bring positive change to society. Oh, God, Frederic, I'm glad you believe that. I hope that I still can. Oh, boy. By the way, when will VidCon come to France? Mm, great question. Mm. And that's more of a question for Hank than for me. I don't, I have no plans currently to bring VidCon to France. But VidCon is coming across the English Channel to England. It is, it is. That's very close by. Yeah, coming so to London, England. we'll be able to see you at uh, VidCon, VidCon UK, if not, if not VidCon Francais. Yes, very good, John, very good. Hank, what did we learn today? John, we learned that Karl von Karlovitz forested. <laughs> we also learned that signed books are, or at least should be, 
actually signed. And uh, we learned that you should do the dishes when you're at a party because everybody will think you're doing the, everybody's such a nice thing, but in fact, you're just trying to not for a second. And lastly, we learned that if you want to protect your home, always get a dachshund. <laughs> No, no one will burgle. That dachshund's a trouble. He's trouble. Yeah, I mean that robber's gonna get their ankles bitten off. No, you won't have all your your eyeball ankle will just get a dachshund tooth right in it. <laughs> You're gonna lose your foot eye for sure. <laughs> All right, John, thank you for podcasting with me. It was an absolute pleasure. If anybody has any uh, suggestions for opening bits or, of course, questions, you can send those to hankandjohn at gmail.com. If you want to put in the subject line opening bits so we know that that's an opening bit and not a question, that will help us when we're organizing things. This podcast is produced by Rosiana Hulse Rojas and Sheridan Gibson. It's edited by the great Nicholas Jenkins. Our head of community and communications is Victoria Bongiorno. The music that you're listening to right now and also the music at the beginning of the podcast was written by Gunnarola. You can follow us on Twitter at Hank Green or at John Green. We also have a Patreon for Dear Hank and John at patreon.com slash Dear Hank and John, where we are about to record our patrons only terrible podcast this week in Ryan's. Thank you again for listening. And as they say in our hometown, don't, don't forget, forget to, to be awesome. awesome.